There are many different ways of looking at oceans. Oceanographers, for example, are concerned with the depth of the ocean and the circulation of the ocean water with its temperature and with its salinity and with its chemistry. Geologists are interested in different aspects of the oceans, and two of those have been illustrated in the film you've just seen. We're concerned with the sediments of the ocean floors, how they're deposited, and what they're composed of, what their general characteristics are, because we must be able to recognize those sediments when we see them again as rocks in the geological record. Another aspect of the oceans that we're interested in was also illustrated in the film, oceans as the source of potential mineral deposits. The manganese nodules are only one of the possible min mineral resources of the oceans. In fact, the ocean water itself may one day be used as a source of the elements which are dissolved in it. But the aspect of the oceans that we want to talk about in the next half hour is different from those two that you saw in the film. We're concerned with the bedrock of the ocean floors, the, the rock which lies beneath the, the sediments. You're already familiar with the fact that the ocean floors are formed of the igneous rock basalt, and that that rock is intruded in the spreading ridges that are usually found in, toward the center of the oceans, and that there the oceanic lithosphere grows. Such a spreading ridge is down the center of the Atlantic quite down the center of the Atlantic. This is not always the case. In the Pacific, the spreading ridge where the basalt is intruded to form the uh, lithospheric plate of the Pacific is not in the center. But that's just a variation. You're also familiar with the fact that the oceanic lithosphere is destroyed down subduction zones where island arcs are built, such as Japan. Now, that picture that did you already have of the ocean floors is rather a difficult one to understand and was rather a difficult one for scientists to accept without good evidence, without a good understanding of the nature of the bedrock of the ocean floors. The oceans, in fact, if we look at them, uh, are rather like a giant conveyor belt system. And the evidence for that picture of the ocean floors as a conveyor belt system comes from the nature of the uh, observation of the Earth's magnetic field over the oceans. During the Second World War, very sensitive magnetometers were developed, that is, instruments which detect the strength and the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. They were developed in order to detect submarines in the, the oceans, in fact. After the Second World War, those same instruments were diverted to a different use. They were diverted to observing the strength and the direction of the Earth's magnetic field itself for scientific purposes. And when those magnetometers were flown over the oceans, such as the Atlantic, for example, it was found that there was a pattern to the magnetic field over the oceans, a pattern that looks rather like this. A pattern of bands where the Earth's magnetic field was strengthened and weakened, alternately strengthened and weakened. The black bands here representing a band where the Earth's magnetic field was a little stronger than it was expected to be. The white bands representing bands where the Earth's magnetic field was a little weaker than it was expected to be. Now, at first, that information was very puzzling. Uh, this was just after the Second World War. It became possible to understand it when people realized how rocks behave after they've crystallized as they're cooling. Remember what the rock of the ocean floor is. It's basalt. And remember what basalt is composed of. It's composed of ferromagnesian minerals, that is, minerals rich in iron and magnesium. Now, most of them, of course, are silicates, silicates like pyroxene, for example. But there's also another iron mineral commonly present in basalt, the mineral magnetite, which is iron oxide. And the behavior of the iron oxide, in particular the behavior, behavior of the atoms of iron in the iron oxide, is very interesting. The atoms of iron don't behave like the perfect spherical little atoms that we've thought of so far. They behave, in fact, like little magnets. They're uh, 
the atomic particles which make up the atom, organize themselves in such a fashion that the atom has a north pole and a south pole, just like any little bar magnet that you can, you can buy in a store, but of course on a, on a minute scale. And when the basalt crystallizes, these little magnets, these little ion atoms, behave in a very interesting fashion. What happens after the rock is crystallized, and these are all individual crystals, and here is a, a magnetite grain enclosed within them, and these are the little iron atoms, or some of them. What happens is, at temperatures of about seven or 800 degrees, that the north poles of these iron atoms point in all kinds of different directions, all kinds of random directions, because remember, they're quite hot, and they're moving around very rapidly. They're not oriented in any particular uh, direction. They're, they're rotating in their places in the mineral structure of the, the magnetite. As the temperature drops and reaches a point about 580 degrees centigrade, that we call the Curie point, those atoms arrange themselves so that the north poles of the atoms all point in the same direction. And that same direction is the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at the place where the rock, the basalt, with its contained magnetite grains, has solidified and cooled. And if you take that piece of basalt or that grain of magnetite and you heat it up again, then the directions of the north poles of the iron atoms will once again become random. And the, the magnetite and the basalt loses its magnetism. You can do the same thing with a nail. If you, you magnetize a nail and uh, hang it on a magnet and heat up the nail, then the nail will fall off the magnet because it loses the ability to become magnetized. It's the same kind of associated behavior of the iron atoms. So that explains then why the basalt of the ocean floors is magnetized, because it contains grains of magnetite, and within the magnetite are iron atoms behaving like little north and south pole magnets. But does it explain why the ocean floor is magnetized in bands? Why there are bands of weak and strong magnetism that we spoke of? Of course it doesn't. Or does it? Well, Consider when the basalt becomes magnetized. It becomes magnetized as it cools from a, from a molten liquid. And where does the molten liquid reach the floors of the ocean? The molten basalt reaches the floors of the ocean in dikes and lava flows in the mid-ocean ridges. In other words, the molten basalt of the ocean floors cools and solidifies in bands, cools and solidifies along the center of the mid-ocean ridges. But does that explain why the ocean floor is magnetized in bands? It explains well, how the ocean floor grows in bands, how the molten material is added in bands, but does it explain, does it explain why it's magnetized in bands? Of course it doesn't. We still can't explain it. But a second very important observation regarding the magnetic field does help us. And that very important observation is that although the north pole of a magnet at present points to the north pole of the Earth, this doesn't seem always to have been